Greetings, my friends. I want to say, first of all, to all of you, I love you all with all my heart. I really do. Whether it's your first time tuning in, whether it's your fifth time, your your hundredth time, your thousandth time, welcome. I love you all with all my heart, and welcome to this weekend's Global Home Church Sermon. I had a sermon scheduled for this weekend, a blockbuster, the biggest sermon that I have ever preached in the last 15 years, but the Lord, as he often does, gave me something even more relevant that's happening right now, so that sermon's going to be put off a week, uh, so if we're not raptured by then, you'll hear it next weekend, Lord willing, unless the Lord gives you something else uh, again before that, but uh, everyone's welcome here. It doesn't matter uh, if you're a Christian or not, if you're religious or not, what your background is, your social standing, the color of your skin, your sexual orientation, it doesn't matter. Jesus doesn't matter to me. I love you equally like he does, and I don't take up any offerings here. I never have, never will, never took a penny from anyone. I don't believe that anyone <clears throat> should ask for even one penny for sharing God's gospel, Jesus Christ's good news. He paid the price on the cross. The Apostle Paul, probably the, 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 the most strong Christian to ever walk the face of the earth, made tents to pay his way. And Jesus says, where two or three gather together in his name, the Holy Spirit's there also. We have thousands around the globe that gather here. He's here strong. If you can't find a brick and mortar church, you're not alone. Very few people can. But if you tune in to my sermons on the weekend that the Lord gives me, and you're here, you're part of my congregation, I'm your pastor, you're the flock Jesus has given me to tend, it's his, you're his flock, but I'm tending until we get raptured, and this is a real church, and you're welcome, and again, I love you all so much. Let's have a word of prayer, and let's dig into today's exciting sermon. Jesus, I love you, and I thank you, and I praise you for each and every person that's tuning in this weekend, Jesus. I, I, lo I love them all so much. And whether they need a spiritual need, if they're if they're unsaved, backslidden, they need a physical need, an emotional need, a marital need, a financial need, a healing touch, whatever it may be, if they have a sick pet, doesn't matter what it is. I pray that you would bless, touch, help, and move, and just anoint them in a special way, and just give them peace in their hearts. And I pray that everyone who hears this message would know you as Lord and Savior or come to you. Give me the words, I pray, so my words be your words, and your question name I ask it, amen. So I'm going to have the... Scripture down at the end this time instead of the beginning, so don't worry, I haven't forgot Scripture. Let's dig into today's sermon. <coughs> Coincidence? You read the title. Coincidence? Hurricane Ian is the 11th, uh, the 11th time a calamity has struck the U.S. within days after we tried to divide Jerusalem. And there'll be, I'm going to continue, I'm going to go through all 11 of them now. First of all, the meaning of the number 11 is important and that it can symbolize disorder, chaos, and judgment in the Bible. Eleven is used 24 times, and the and the eleventh can be found 19 times coming after 10, which represents the law and responsibility. Eleven represents the opposite, which is the irresponsibility of breaking the law, which brings disorder and judgment. Does that sound familiar to you? The, but God says that anyone, first of all, every, every bit of Israel is God's is, is God's land, and they're his, they're his, his eternal, eternal land. The, the Jews are his are his people through eternal covenant, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jerusalem is God's eternal city. And God said anyone that gives up even an inch of Israel faces wrath, or anyone that tries to encourage it faces wrath and faces judgment and chaos. That's what we're seeing right now. We've been seeing it since 1979. Let's dig in. The first time, the last time, the U.S. government refused to veto an anti-Israel resolution at the U.N. Security Council was in 1979. March 22nd, from Jimmy Carter, President Carter. He chose not to veto UN Resolution 446. Within four days, on March 26th, the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty was signed in Washington. And as a result of that treaty, Israel gave up a huge amount of its land. Two days later, on March 28th, the worst nuclear power plant disaster, two days later, in U.S. history, made headlines all over the globe. I remember this. The following comes from Wikipedia. The Three Mile Island accident was a partial nuclear meltdown that occurred on May 28, 1979, in reactor number two of Three Mile Island Nuclear Generating Station in Dolphin County, Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania. It was the most significant accident in U.S. commercial nuclear power plant history. The incident was rated a five on the seven point international nuclear event scale, an accident with wider consequences. And again, that was right after that the U.S. president tried to mess with Israel. The second event. That was 79. Now let's go to 1991, to, uh, October 30th, 91. President George H.W. Bush, that's senior Bush, opened the Madrid Peace Conference, which brought Israel and Palestine together, together to negotiate for the very first time. 
In his opening speech, Bush told Israel that territorial compromise is essential for peace. And at the exact same time that was happening, the perfect storm was brewing in the Atlantic Ocean. This huge storm traveled 1,000 miles in the wrong direction, which, which made 35-foot waves slam straight into President Bush's own house in Kennebunkport, Maine. You getting this? Okay. Is this coincidence or not? Number three, you, you be the judge. Number three, on August 23rd, 1992, the Madrid Peace Conference moved to Washington, D.C., and the very next day, Hurricane Andrew made landfall in Florida, causing $30 billion in damage. It was the worst natural disaster in the U.S. in history. Okay? I guess that uh, Bush didn't learn. That was a year later. On January 16th of 94, President Clinton met with, with President Assad of Syria to discuss the possibility of Israel giving up the Golan Heights. And within 24 hours of this happening, the huge monstrosity Northridge earthquake hit Southern California. It was the second worst natural disaster in the U.S. history. Are you, are you, are, is this coincidence or not? Are you hearing me? Are you feeling me? Number five, on January 21st, 1998, Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu arrived at the White House but received a very cold reception. In fact, President Clinton and Secretary of State Madeleine Albright actually refused to have lunch with President Netanyahu. And that was the exact same day the Monica Lewinsky scandal broke, sending the Clinton presidency into a tailspin from which it would never, ever, ever recover. You getting this? You getting this? All this stuff's happening within days of Israel being messed with. This time, God, this time they weren't trying to take Israel's land, but they were trying to snub God's chosen leader. So instead of sending a huge storm or a huge storm appearing during that time, God decided to mess with the presidency and make it where it would never recover ever, ever again. You getting all this? Number six, on September 28th, 1998, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright was working on finalizing a plan which would have Israel give up 13% of Judea and Samaria. On that exact day, Hurricane George slammed in on the Gulf Coast with wind gusts up to 175 miles an hour. You getting this? Number seven, coincidence or not? Number seven, on May 3rd, 1999, Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat was supposed to hold a press conference to declare the creation of a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as the capital. On that very day, the most powerful tornadoes that ever recorded in the U.S. history ripped through Oklahoma and Kansas. At one point, one of the tornadoes actually had a recorded speed of 316 miles an hour. Wow! That's more than twice what Hurricane Ian has let me in a Florida. 316 miles an hour? You getting this? <coughs> Number eight. On April 30th, 2003, the roadmap to peace that had been developed by the by the Peace Quartet was presented to Israel Prime Minister Ariel Sharon by the U.S. Ambassador Daniel Kutzner. Over the next week, the next six days, the U.S. was hit by a staggering 412 tornadoes. It was the largest tornado cluster in history. Wow. Number nine. In 2005, President George W. Bush, that's Jr., convinced Israel it was necessary to remove all the Jewish settlers out of Gaza and turn it over entirely to the Palestinians. In the New York Times, the very last of the settlers were evacuated on August 23rd, 2005. On that very day, a storm that would be given the name Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, started forming over the Bahamas. The city of New Orleans still has not fully recovered from the damage that storm has caused, and it ranked as the costliest natural disaster in all of U.S. history. Notice we get, keep getting more cost and coster. Even later in time, it keeps going up and up and up. Man, man, man. Number 10, we're getting there. Is this, is this all coincidence, my friends, or is it just, or is God trying to say something? Number 10. On May, 10, May 19th, 2011, Barack Obama told Israel there must be a return to the pre-67 borders. Three days later, on May 22nd, a half-mile-wide EF5 tornado, a multiple vortex tornado, ripped through Joplin, Missouri. According to Wikipedia, it was the costliest, single most costliest disaster tornado in U.S. history. Okay? And number 11, here we go. Biden talks Israel into giving up part of Jerusalem for a future Palestinian state, and Israel's leader agrees with it to give part of, of Jerusalem away to Palestinian state. Exactly one week later, this is the only time it's been exactly seven days later, that's key, seven days later, Florida's deadliest ever hurricane hits, what they're calling it now, the deadliest ever, is what they expect it to be, then changes course and goes back out to sea, then comes back to shore, and the rarest of rarities, you just don't see this happening, it's so rare, 
it became a hurricane again. It did become a tropical storm and screwed up the coast and the ocean, maybe affect a little winter rain. Actually, a hurricane, tropical storm, hurricane, back into the water, hurricane, and back again. Who knows what's going to happen next? And then it hit another state as a hurricane. Unbelievable. Now, that was seven days after Biden said this. The number seven symbolizes completeness in the Bible. I'm convinced the rapture is so close now, and with Israel saying they will divide Jerusalem for a Palestinian capital, this may be the completeness of these calamities, as once Israel's divided, then the real calamities, the bold and vile judgments of God begin, along with all Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophets' judgments. Now, check it out. God's a God of numbers. He's always done numbers. My next sermon that, that I had to put off it has a lot of numbers in it as well. God loves numbers. He loves to repeat those numbers. And those numbers in the Bible, I'm not talking about no numerology garbage. I mean, actual numbers in the Bible. These numbers have significance in a big way from God. It's now been 43 years since all these disasters began. Since 79 to now, it's been 43 years, okay? book The 43rd book out of 49 in the original canonized scripture is 2 Thessalonians. So let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The King James Version Bible. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, that, that, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, break time. Falling away, the great apostasy is happening in full scale, and I believe that the Antichrist is here, and he'll be totally re revealed after the rapture. Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is, is as God, sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was w yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who, no who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. That's the Holy Spirit. He's holding things back, letting things happen. When he's gone, it's all going to break loose. And we're right on the threshold of that, my friends. Verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Talk about the Antichrist here. He's coming very, very soon. And with all deceiv deceivableness, of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And again, this world is so anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-Bible, does not want to hear the truth. Verse 11. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. We're seeing that right now everywhere. And the strongest delusion, I believe, will be the aliens as the excuse for the imminent rapture. That's the strongest delusion. Verse 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Again, this all ties in to this whole thing starting in 1979, and the, the entire, the entire 43 years, I gave you 1 to 11. I told you what the number 11 means in the Bible. The number 7, which is a week from this one. Amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. So you can sit, you can tell me if you think this is coincidence or is it God incidents. I, I believe that God incidents is what trumps everything. I don't believe in coincidence in life. I believe in God incidents. It's my personal opinion always, but I want you as a listener to decide, decide for yourself. Make up your own mind. Or all the stuff that I've read you, all these 11 things that have happened in the last 43 years in the scripture and the numbers that match everything else from the Bible, you tell me, is this a coincidence or is God saying, leave my people Israel alone. Don't mess with them or you mess with me. You get to decide. I'm, I'm running out of time. Jesus Christ is all of our only host, my friends. If you've never been saved, you're backslidden. Pray the prayer. Do the six steps in a box about a video. No one's guaranteed more time in your life. I don't want to see anyone left behind for the hellish nightmare, which would be seven year tribulation, which God said would be the worst time in history. Billions and billions and billions would die the most grotesque, awful, perfect deaths imaginable. If you like prayer for anything, contact me. I'll pray for you every day. Again, I love you all with all my heart. I truly do. And look up true Christians. Our redemption draweth nigh. Be fly soon. May God bless you. Share this sermon. Help me get the word out and tune in next weekend, man. Woo! I'm so excited. I was so excited about today, but the Lord led me a different direction. But I got that sermon loaded up and ready. And unless God gives me something else, it'll be next weekend. But it's coming up. That sermon's coming up soon, regardless. Hopefully it's next weekend, unless I, unless I die or we're raptured first. You all take care of yourselves. Keep your lamps filled with oil, with the Holy Spirit. Make sure you're, you're, you're witnessing and praying what little time we have left. Stay strong and understand the rapture is pre-tribulation. It's the way the Bible says it is. Don't let anyone steal your joy. Keep yourself ready to go. Be a wise virgin. I'll meet you all in the sky so soon. Give you all a big hug in heaven, and we'll be chilling forever, getting out of this filthy, wicked, festering, hell hole, sewer hole, cesspool we're forced to live in until then.
You guys take care of yourselves. May God bless you. I love you. Share the sermon and get the word out. We fly soon. Take care.